Welcome back, everybody, and shout out to all those people out there riding their bicycles in this hot ass weather. And speaking of bike rides, I want to remind you that on April 23rd, we are doing a bike ride to one of the locations of our sponsor, Movita, Movita Juice Bar. So we're going to be riding our bike from the Esquina Bike Shop in Boyle Heights all the way to Movita Juice Bar on Figueroa, right in front of um, USC. Uh, we're doing that together with Movita, together with Esquina Bike Shop, and together with Eric at Orale Boyle Heights Podcast. Take a um, look them up as well. And so I just want to remind you to like and subscribe. And if you subscribe, you have a chance to win a bicycle, a Linus bicycle that we are raffling off that day. Um, check out my Instagram for more details on this bike ride and more details on the bike. It is a... Uh, an easy bike ride, friendly for everybody, so please join us. This is not a race. This is a chill bike ride. And um, our guest today is our first dive into the performing arts, and uh, she's an actress. Her name is Anaí Bustillos. Let's get into it. Welcome back to the Dancing Sober podcast, and today we are joined by <laughs> La Actriz Sensacional, Anaí okay. Bustillos. Hola. Welcome to the show. Thank you. ¿Cómo estás? Nerviosa. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that you're in your home. Estás en tu casa. Okay. Um, you know, feel like you do because I know you travel a lot. Try to get to that place that you get to when you're out somewhere just chilling in the middle of a mountain and just oh, okay. relaxing. Just find that spot and relax. Okay. And... We're going to ask you questions about you and introduce people to you, too, you know, and um, hopefully um, also teach some people about steps in life that are, you know. Pivotal. Pivotal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Anai, you are a actress. Yes. And how long have you been an actress? I arrived in Los Angeles 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago. Let's go so, back a little bit. and see, where, did, where were you born? And I was born in El Paso, Texas. Oh, Texas. I didn't know. Yes. I actually just recently went back in January for the first time in over a decade to El Paso, and it was wow. such a moment. <laughs> I like went to go see one of my childhood homes and oh, just yeah. to see on a grander scale where I was brought up, how I was born, and who I am today. Yeah. But the acting and the performance wasn't until, I would say, high school. I think I actually always sang quietly in my room, and that was my first love. But then it got suppressed. <laughs> um, well, how and old are you? The and like, what were you singing? How old are you? Um, well, I wasn't brought up in a house that played music. Mm -hmm. um, my parents had not the best taste. I loved them very much. Um, but in elementary, we learned classical music. Mm. There was a classical program, and it was kind of the first sound that really plucked my heartstrings. Mm. And um, I think that began the relationship that I have so deeply mm. with music. Okay. And you started singing through that, or you started just... Yeah, I did, did you choir. you learn to play instruments? And, no, I, no, I always... I sang, I did choir, <clears throat> and then I have a very loud voice. Mm. But um, because it was... As depressed, I was so soft spoken when I sang, mm. which is interesting because who I am as a person when I walk through life, I am a very vocal person. Mm. How I feel, mm. boundaries, and protecting and defending other people. So in that category, mm. I have the volume, but for singing, it was, it, it is, it still is very difficult. Hmm. And so. You're saying that that's when your love for music began and you started singing on your own in, in your room and... Yeah, I would like sing in my room or I'd go for walks and like come up with melodies or words in my head and it's something that I kind of just always kept in the backlogs and, mm. you know, sing in the mirror. Yeah. But... Um, you had to be a Selena fan, of course. I did not know who Selena was. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, in fact, recently... I thought it was, like, t mandatory in Texas that you, like, study Selena or something. No, which is interesting because I was, mm -hmm. you know, brought up in the border, and we, we hopped <clears throat> around a lot in Texas. So mm -hmm. I ended up in Arlington, which is right by Dallas. 
But I actually grew up with hard rock and roll. Hmm. Hard rock, Dirty South rap, and then like Tori Amos. <laughs> Wait, and who's Bjorn. your favorite Dirty South rapper? Um, Luda. So the, so, no, I didn't know Luda then. Luda's West Coast, isn't he? No, Ludacris. No, he's. I think oh, he's, yeah, South South. Yeah. Uh, like Silk the Shocker. Like, oh, okay, like, yeah, yeah. Um, Master P and the. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm hmm. No limits. Bone thugs and, oh, and harmony. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah. drove a red track, bumped that bass. Nice. And hard rock and roll. <laughs> okay, so um, you were singing and you were listening to all this music. You weren't into Selena. And you said that your singing got suppressed? My voice got suppressed. Um, because I am a very vocal person, mm. I would get in so much trouble mm. in my household. <laughs> Uh, for speaking mm -hmm. about emotions, for yeah. speaking what I felt was yeah, true. Well, what's wrong with you? Right, yeah, <laughs> totally. Like, what's wrong with you? You're too sensitive. It's Jesus. like the typical black sheep yeah. story. And even today, like my voice and my community, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the things I've gone through, kind of, I'm still working on it. Mm -hmm. But it has enabled me to be a very precise communicator. Mm -hmm. um, which can make a lot of people feel uncomfortable if it's not the right time or they are mm. not open to hearing things. Got it. So being brought up in that house, my voice got me in a lot of trouble and caused a lot of destruction in my life. Mm. And so you think that that made you shy down from singing? A hundred percent. I actually yeah. didn't even get into choir in high yeah. school because my voice was so <clears throat> quiet. Wow. So I kind of just put that love aside. I mean, I always loved music. As soon as I moved to Los Angeles, I worked at KCRW for seven years. Oh, no I was a volunteer. Like music oh. is um, one of my lifelines, that mm. and dancing. So how did you or why did you come to LA? Um, yeah, to be an actress, but also to... Did you do theater in high school? I did theater in high okay. school. We had a wonderful theater program, Martin High School in Texas. Um, is a wonderful theater program. I also, I was so naive and I knew nothing of politics at that age, mm. but whatever was going on wasn't working for me. Mm. <laughs> I was like a- What year was it? Uh, <laughs> 2000. Okay. So I was like a, like a firecracker in like a little glass vase. So mm. I had to leave my environment mm. and um, go find a place where I felt more aligned. Did you come alone? I moved out here with two girls that were in the theater department, mm. and then we lived together, and then I realized that was not a good idea. Mm. And I have pretty much lived alone ever since. <laughs> <laughs> um, you really get to know somebody when you live with them. Mm, well, yeah. and, um, <laughs> and I had had like my relationship and my experience with drug usage in high school. Mm. So by the time I got here, it was like tapering off a little bit, mm. and I had to figure out how to like pay bills. So, you know, those girls were just beginning that journey and I was like, I can't, I can't come on yeah. to that. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. I know the, <clears throat> I know the vibe. So you come out here and you just start auditioning, you just start like crazy auditioning. Did you get an agent or? I, God, I, I wish I remembered what this book was called. Um, I think I still have it, but it kind of gave like One a of step those by how step. To yeah, Hollywood books. How to begin? Because yeah. I knew nothing. Yeah. I knew nobody, and I, you know, I think I enrolled at SMC at the time, mm. which good program, great program, mm. great school. Mm. I was studying photography at the same time. I I didn't work well with school. Mm. I had I would get in trouble a little bit, you know, um, so I left. <laughs> And There's a pattern. <laughs> uh, people need to be told what's up. No, <laughs> is yeah. what, is what There's not a lot of people that are brave enough to speak up. And no. And when you do, yeah. it's a yeah. great blessing and it causes, mm -hmm. you have to navigate it consciously. But I, it was so different. My God, you know, I got black and white headshots. I mailed mm. out over a hundred envelopes with my cover sheet and my resume, which was just a little school. postcard and all that. Little postcard, yeah. my black and white, you know, printed headshot. I got like three phone calls, and I got signed with Daniel Hoff, which is a great agency. Mm. And I got my first theatrical agent. Um, 
but I was still obviously only 18. I had this like mm. naive sense of confidence. And I have always been tall. I'm 5'10", I shrank a little bit, I'm 5'9 and a half. Um, but I, I wasn't fully embodied, you know? <coughs> I was long and lanky and- um, You were young. I was young. Yeah. And, but I also had, I was young, but I had the voice and the presence of someone mm. older. Mm. Um, so yeah, I just began auditioning at that point, getting faxes, that's how mm, they yeah, would send them. <laughs> and um, I think I got my first job when I was like 23, I was Taff Hartlead. Mm. Um, her name slips my mind. She, she passed away actually from brain cancer, but she gave me my first opportunity and it was a mm. guest star, top of the show guest star on a show called Medium and I was Taft Hartlead. And oh. And I was going to get into that later, but um, you and I have that in common. I also worked on Medium. Really? But I worked on the last two seasons, and you did it somewhere like, like in like the, the middle. Like the third or fourth yeah, episode. you were 2005. I was 2000, like what did you eight do? and nine. But I worked with the location managers, and I was head of like all the securities that like guard everything. Uh huh. <laughs> so I like I, po I made posts for the security guards. Like, all right, you're going to be here, and I, I manage them. Together with the locations managers. You've done yeah a lot of stupid jobs. Myriad yeah. <laughs> of professions. Yeah, I, I, that was um I did a few shows, but that's the one that I worked on a pretty long time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, that was my first job. Yeah, and you you have a really good like lineup of TV shows that is impressive. So if you don't mind me saying, Medium, CSI, Shameless, Girl Meets World, where you were like this badass Spanish teacher. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that. That was really cool. Um, and we met on Rise of the Brown Buffalo, mm -hmm. which was interesting. That's probably actually one of my favorite jobs. Yeah. So that's a documentary on the Brown Buffalo, mm -hmm. and Senor Oscar Acosta. And uh, we met on that set, and then, but you've also gone on to do Bosch, Goliath, SWAT, and you had an episode on Insecure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which one was that? Uh, it was a Thanksgiving episode. No, oh. I think it was, I shot it in 2019, I think, oh. before everything changed. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's an impressive, and these are not all of your credits. You have a lot more credits. I do. These are not all of your credits. That's an impressive lineup, just that. I've also done, I, it took me 10 oh. years to book a commercial. I don't know how I did oh, yeah, you do it. I think I learned how to smile. Yeah authentically <laughs> and uh, be present in the room but I l l yeah I you, you know a ton of commercials I'm often just watching TV and I'm like there she is again <laughs> that's a trip how many commercials you book I yeah I I do I mean granted I was broke and a waitress for almost like 15 years but yeah. I was that's yeah, not overnight it was not overnight, yeah. I, but I, you know, I mean, you just being told us actor, how you came out here with nothing. Nada. Yeah, and your little book. My, my, my book. And my CDs, okay. which I still have. I don't know what to do with those. But um, <laughs> I, you know, have been making a living off of being an actress for almost a decade now. Mm. And the, the struggle has always been very, very real. But yeah. there was a period where I had to work on my lack of money. Mm. Um, in order to push forward. So what'd you do? Um, I had to d dive in deep and say why I had that fear of money, always the lack. Mm. Granted, I was broke all the time. Mm. Um, Teach me your ways. I will. <laughs> go on, go I on. I will. Okay. I just, I, I think it was a lot of, you, you can get so deep into this, but like a lot of visualization and just time. knowing, <laughs> just knowing your worth, you yeah, know, yeah. your worth. Granted, I'm still working yeah. on that in other aspects of my life, but mm -hmm. you know, even when I was, I haven't been working for eight months. And every time that, you know, that fear will still pop in of like, girl, you just <laughs> quit your profession of 20 years. Like, what did you do? Mm -hmm. um, and I just know that the, the money will come, that like I am mm -hmm. following my right path and it will come mm -hmm. um it, it really is just like a trust factor in mm -hmm. knowing your value financially mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so when you were younger and you were having these fears would it besides like becoming more aware of your worth and understanding your worth mm -hmm. what did you 
like actually physically do? Did you audition more? Did you fight for higher paying jobs? Um, it's a little controversial. Let's hear it. Well, when I was 32, you know, <clears throat> there's more awareness of it now, but no one teaches actors finances. Yeah, of course. So you're broke, you're broke, you make uh, money, you spend the money, you get out of debt, and then uh, you're back to broke. And it's this like, job. <laughs> always, yeah. always. And so I had made money, I'd lost it, I had traveled, which was my version of getting an education. Mm-hmm. And um, I was like 32 and I reached another like pinnacle moment. It was it was so low and I my ego didn't allow me to like reprint out my waitress resume and I mm-hmm. should have done it earlier. And I had to end up, I was door dashing, so I was running around all day, going to auditions, coming mm-hmm. home, door dashing, and I was beat. Like I'm, I'm, I don't have that hustle. Ment- I don't have that endless amount of energy. Mm. Mine's uh, finite. <laughs> you know, I gotta rest. Um, and mortal. so <laughs> I went fight core. Mm. I relinquished my union status, which I worked very hard to get, mm-hmm. and I went fight core. And I lost some friends in that process, and it's a huge controversy. Wait, explain that to me, please. So when you're I C O R fight core, so what fight core means is you relinquish your union status. Ooh. And then you are then working non-union jobs. You can then legally work, n- legally work non-union jobs and still work union jobs, oh, okay. and still keep your health benefits. Oh wow! So, but in that process, because so many commercials have gone non-union, it weakens the mm. union. Got it. And me being, you know, a fighter in the street and an advocate for my community, I got a lot of shade for going against my union. Mm. However, I went to union meetings and I would go to those boards and I see nothing but white people and they say like, oh, we did all we can. I don't know. It's just the way things are. And I was like, that, <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, like I've seen unions fight for their people mm. and they weren't fighting. Mm. And I know where my moral compass stands. Mm. And so I went fight core. That then enabled me to go back into the more audition rooms. Mm. Because when you don't step into the audition room for a long time, you lose that presence you know mm. it's it's a muscle that you have to build to go in and out in and out rejection mm. not and not let your nerves overtake you mm. and then i started booking non-union work and then i got a um a sag walmart commercial and that pulled me out of my entire debt and so then i started to like raise my limit of okay i won't won't work for less than this i won't work less than this mm. because when you're on those sets you're still working with union directors. You're still working with union, you know, uh, teamsters. Like mm-hmm. those are the same people, and they see you working, and they see you on set. And then I think <sighs> one of my last jobs that I worked, I um, they flew me to Cape Town, South Africa, business class, <laughs> changed my life. And I wait, what was it? A it was an Amazon commercial. Okay. They flew me on Emirates business class. That's wow. Great, and I. At that time, I had completely pulled myself out of debt. I had begun a small savings, which Mm. I had never really had before. Mm -hmm. I had come into contact with someone that gave me financial knowledge, and I'm so grateful for them. Mm -hmm. Like, I wouldn't be where I am today financially with that knowledge had that not been given to me Mm. for free. Mm -hmm. Um, And so then I began the process of refiling my paperwork to go back into the union, Mm -hmm. because my intention was to get my feet back on the ground and Mm -hmm. a little bit higher and then let the other people that need those opportunities have them. Mm -hmm. So I knew where my morals stood the entire time, but I did get in quarrels and lost some friendships in the process that questioned my value system. But at the same time, you knew your worth and you had to. I knew where my (laughs) morals were and I, you know what? I, I wasn't I wasn't gonna go back to waitressing. I'm a, I, God has humbled me more times <clears throat> than I feel yeah. absolutely necessary. Could I have waitressed again? Yes. Mm-hmm. But there comes a moment that you have to let go of all those side jobs and really gamble into, I can do this, I can make this as a living mm-hmm. and go into it 100%. And that doesn't mm-hmm. mean it's easy. It mm-hmm. does kind of make you hustle more, mm-hmm. you know? But um, I, at that point, I just, I couldn't run around like that anymore. So when you started getting more work, do you let go of that fight course status or how does that work? Do I did let, yes, I filed back. to go back into the union, how to write a letter, their communication, communication skills were not great. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm still not, anyways, I could go on about it, but I won't. Um, 
I repaid to get back in. I gave them all my financial statements since I had been gone. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I was organized Mm because they were like, hey, we need this in a week. And I'm like, really? (laughs) You want three three years worth of finances in a week? (laughs) Okay. Um, And so I refiled and I got back into the union. Wow. Mm -hmm. And how long has that been since you did that? Oh, um, that was a while ago, right? Yeah, that was a while ago. Yeah. I think 2018. And since then, has the union been good to you, or is it still a struggle? I mean, like I can tell you that when I was on set, and I'm like dark Mexican man who also looks Arab, so it's like very dark ethnic man. Man, I there's a lot of racism, you know. It's like there's a lot of cowards, like clear and like racism like right in front of you like yeah. they're not even embarrassed to do it to us that i mean i was with the security guard so they're like you know that's eh, fucking security you know but still what if you didn't have security <laughs> i mean it's still like fucked up shit that i would see happen you know yeah so i'm sure there was still some of that I me mean, i mean i have to pick and choose my battles <clears throat> very consciously mm-hmm. um i've had friends say if you felt so strongly why don't you work for the union, why don't you support the union? And that's not my fight. Um, I would rather use my energy somewhere else, especially now since I'm retired. (laughs) I wanna Um, get into that, but. (laughs) I, uh, yeah, there's a whole dialogue to go on about the union. There's always two sides and I have been out of loop of it, so I can't speak of where they stand now. I just know that there's advocates that I fall more aligned with. Mm. Um, but when I was making that decision to go fight core, I did take over a year to make that decision. And um, I, at that point, did not see the union really, mm. really fighting, like making strong moves, mm. you know? For you. <coughs> For a lot of actors. Mm. You know, I think at the time, God, what was I saying? We should just all uh, go on strike. Mm. Like. I, to me, I think at that time we should have just gone on strike hmm. until the job started to come back. You know, hmm. this one book, I forgot what it's called, but you just really need like a third of a population to actually make waves in making large changes like that. And hmm. I think things like that are so possible, but you really have to go 10 steps above and be like, fine, you won't come to us, then we all strike. Hmm. You know, that's, I think, would be our power move. Hmm. Wow. That's. A definite like hurdle. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was like, mm, not my fight. So I wanna, I wanna go back a little bit, and how you came to LA because you were in this theater program that you loved and all that, but you wanted to be an actor, but you didn't study acting here. Did you do workshops and things like that? I found teachers. Okay. I did a lot of uh, independent study with a lot of teachers, a lot of different methods. And it wasn't until my early 30s, um, not too long ago, actually a little bit of long ago, my God, time. <laughs> um, and I met one of the most profound teachers, and his name is Larry Moss, and mm. he really, uh, like, he's saved so many lives mm. and such a profound teacher. And um, because his way in teaching, he's such a deeply compassionate, empathetic teacher first off, um, but he really makes us be more conscious of our mental health and making that primary mm. in being an actor. Mm. Because you see actors constantly going for the same roles because they're good at it. It's in their nature, it's mm. their essence. Mm. That's kind of all roles that we want is our essence. Mm. Um, and then you see a lot of mental health issues in the acting community. Mm -hmm. People break, they snap, Mm -hmm. because something is not, (laughs) talk about that. Um, But it is not something, this is in in the world in general, but you know, when you were, what's his name, Michael Kay, such a wonderful actor. That's Mary Kay. Michael. I'm kidding. Michael Kay, I wanna say Phillips and that's not right. You know, he passed away from an overdose and the last job Mm. he had was someone who had an addiction. Mm. And it brings up your deep, dark demons if they have Mm. not been addressed. Mm. And if they're not handled with care, it can do Mm. such destruction. Which, one of the reasons (laughs) that I 
have decided to retire <laughs> is because at this point in my life, I don't want to pretend to be other people for mm. a profession in, in this time. All right, I'm going to go back a little bit again. Okay. What method, you said you tried different methods. Mm -hmm. So which method? Imagination. Imagination. Pure imagination. The SpongeBob method. Really? Imagination. That's yeah. adorable. That's a. See, I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's adorable. Use your imagination. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And just and having your emotional body relaxed and so, open and really be committed to a storyline. Did you ever see the TV show um, Extras? It was on no, HBO. it was a British show, right? Yeah, it was a British show, and it was um, I forget his name, but the guy that used to host the Oscars. And he's doing. Oh, this, I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah, he's doing the guy from the original office. Yeah. He's doing this um, scene with uh, Ian McKellen, I think it is. And <laughs> he's like, you know, how do you do it? How do you work? He's like, well, I get the lines in my trailer and then I read my lines and I memorize them and then I walk, 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 walk. And then I'm on set. <laughs> the director says, action. And then I, I act. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then they say, cut. And I walk, 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 walk back to my trailer and I rest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You just act like, you know, it's imagination. I mean, the idea of like pulling from what? someone's, you know, our history and our experience is yeah. uh, so small. Yeah. And if I have to think of something that broke my heart tragically and I have to dive back into that to feel an emotion in the scene, first of all, I'm not committed to that storyline. Yeah. And second of all, that I'm, I'm a Pisces. I'm going to cry about that. Yeah. You know, that's going to take <laughs> me a minute to recover. So the method acting was that um Stanislavski, uh, Stanislavski. so the, the method acting is not your way like not like a De Niro no. who else said that I think um <coughs> Heath people? Ledger right no yeah they're I mean it, it is it actually talented, does go crazy so in like in my small period of acting I I like loved diving into that shit and just like being in it and but then I also remember this quote that was like, your day will be like that thought upon which you dwell the most. Mm -hmm. And so if you're dwelling on this fucking a character and what they're going through, like you're going to have a fucked up fucking yeah. day, month and months. And if you're in a theater show. Yeah, completely. Yeah. If you're in a theater show and like you're you're. You're learning it, you're ex you're rehearsing it, and then you're running it, you know, for months. I think it, it carries with you. It Absolutely. definitely does carry with you, and, mm -hmm. it, and it weighs on you. And Yeah. It's impressive. I like anything that's convincing. I think if you're not a method actor, but you can convince me that you are <laughs> going through whatever you're going through in that scene, then, then all power, you know congrats because that's all you have to do is be convincing and what I tell people that want to try acting is like all you have to do is think <laughs> when you're in front of the camera like there has to be something going on in your head <laughs> you yeah know, like, you gotta just, be in the yeah in the carry story. something even if you're <laughs> I remember somebody said even if you're like worrying about like leaving the beans on you know <laughs> like let me see that fear <laughs> in your face that I left is, the beans on a lot of act I can't generalize like that. I'll get so much. Some actors mm. don't have a good grasp on their own identity. Mm. And so it's easier for them to jump in and out of these characters. Mm. But that thought process that you're talking about, when they're not acting, that thought process may not be, if they haven't found their authenticity within themselves, mm. then it, I don't know, I just, I see the translation from being on camera to off camera and I'll still be like, wait, who, who are you though? <laughs> you know, um, one of the girls in terrible with on the spot things, euphoria, mm. the blonde, terrible with names also. Um, she even said, she's like, so many people identify with my characters and she's like, that's amazing because I'm still on the journey of finding out who I am. Mm. And I think that that is so powerful for her to have that, Mm. awareness mm. of she can fill in the spots of all these characters and who they are and their pain and their joy and their faults but still be aware that you know you're on your self-discovery mm. as a human I mean I guess we all are endlessly um, yeah. 
but that awareness is very key. And that's another thing to to really know is that you're always on the journey. <laughs> it doesn't end like yeah. I had a friend ask me once, uh, like, friend, when does it like when does it stop? Like, when do I figure it out? It's like, mm, no, we <laughs> no, it's going to keep going and you're going to keep trying to figure it out and you're going to keep having um, good discoveries, though. Like, I'm all about discoveries in life. And like, you know, you get to a certain point where you're like, wow, this is awesome. You know, a whole nother like world to dive into or a whole nother like feeling or understanding, you know, so just like continue to discover. And that's something that I learned from theater, too, is like I remember the evolution of like showing discoveries in a, in a theatrical performance, showing the, the characters' discoveries. And mm -hmm. in life, you also continue to have these discoveries. And yeah. Now, you also have done theater, mm -hmm. right? Because I saw you at a show once at the Complex. Oh, right? yeah. yeah. That was fun. <laughs> I like doing comedy. Have you done a lot of theater? No. no. I mean, I did it in high school and... I worked a bit at the Theatricum Botanicum up in Topanga. Okay, yeah. Um, but I haven't done as much theater as I would have liked to. Yeah. That's a whole nother realm. Yeah. Uh, that often doesn't pay. No. And there's generally a lot of different politics involved in that mm -hmm. journey. Yeah. It's different groups and different cliques and different... Yeah. And I, I think at the time... When I was like, okay, I have to make an income off of this solely. I have to let a little of my other interests just set aside for a second so I can mm. focus. And I was focused more on television and mm. commercials to bring in the income. Well, <clears throat> yeah, theater does not pay. I don't know at what level it pays. I mean, you have to be like on Broadway or something to like actually make money. In, in no, I think, no. I mean, I think we we have really good theater in Los Angeles and mm -hmm. you can still, you know, get paid. Yeah. Not, Not a bull lot. wage. Yeah. Consistently, you, need, you still need other streams of income. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when you're getting paid for the stage performances, sometimes it's only three a week. You know. I think it depends on the contract. Yeah. It all depends on the contract. Interesting. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, the last thing that you did, I think it's the last thing, or one of the latest things that you've done is a video game. Yes. Tom Clancy's, let me get the name right, Rainbow Six. Mm -hmm. X. Excursion, explosion, X something. <laughs> they have, they have I know those different ones. multitude of yeah. different. And so you play this character, Mira, uh -huh. who is the head of research and development. Wow, you really did <laughs> That's your fighting research. this fucking crazy ass virus. Mm -hmm. Nothing like Corona. It's a fucking crazy mm -hmm. ass. Like, um, uh, what was that? Um, War of the Worlds kind of virus taking mm -hmm. over the whole. This is like their world. new. <laughs> game they we put one out in um early 2020 the other game came out so this mm. is like the second round that i get to participate in and now this world of video games does this open up a whole nother thing for you that you've never been a part of before because i'm like yeah i mean it, cause did, it did video game time. fans are completely different like, <laughs> do you get to do like comic cons and things like that fans. I mean, I would have. Man, yeah. 2020 really oh, okay. took away from that. Yeah. Um, That's right. It came out like right. When yeah, they started, right? I I actually was in Canada uh, shooting when everything started happening, but it definitely introduced a lot more fans to know who I am, and mm. that that world is you know I don't I don't play video games. I, mean, I don't have yeah. that time. I probably <laughs> have that time. I'm just using it to do something different. <laughs> the guys actually here at the studio knew about the game. Really? Yeah, they play it. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. Oh, um, but it was such a lovely team to work with, and um, I'm still that character, so mm. that's still a job. Wow, they get to keep. What was that experience like, though? Like, it was all green screen, or was it, um, or is it just Mo your cap? I'll explain that, please. Mo cap, where they put that the dots like, in the. That sounds like no cap, bro. No, no cap, cap, bro, bro. No, <laughs> <laughs> no gotta, Mo um, cap. <laughs> Mo motion capture. So oh, motion capture. Okay. You, you know, wear yeah. those tight little, the little suits. Little balls. Uh huh. Yeah. And you just have to imagine everything. So, mm -hmm. like, you know, they'll give you like imagine a make makeshift gun, and you really gotta, you know, position it right mm. and whatnot. Um, it was super fun. I was actually pinned for a series regular at the time, 
and I lost that job, which enabled enabled me to get this job. Mm. And that pilot actually never ended up airing. So I was like, I really lucked out because the people that I met on this job were so lovely. Mm. It was a great experience going up to Canada and it kept me Montreal. busy. Mm -hmm. mm. It kept me busy during 2020. So I was recording audio in my closet mm -hmm. when everything was shut down. Montreal is like another little giant not little it's like another production production world mm -hmm. right it's yeah. like the Vancouver whole and Montreal yeah so is it cold up there no. <laughs> yeah <laughs> I bought a very heavy jacket that I haven't worn <laughs> since ah that's cool so how many months did that take shooting this whole thing and and um I also I watched a lot of this on YouTube um to get a feel of the game and I'm wondering where your character's from, because the Thanks. accent, oh, she's from Spain. Man, I, I get thought maybe it was Brazil or something. No, that's yeah. so interesting. I get coached on <clears throat> every line oh. because we wanted the dialect to be so specific, specific to yeah. a certain area in Spain. Um, I've had the same dialect coach the whole time. So I've, I've really, since um, nearing the end of 2019 to recently, I'm always kind of working on it. They'll call me in and mm. to do some lines. Um, but I haven't been able to do mocap since 2020. Hmm. But it'll open up soon, right? Yeah. yeah. So this has been a wild ride for you. Yeah. La Señorita Actriz Ana Bustillos doing all these roles, working hard, auditioning, showing up on set, you know, killing it for so many years. And, and now you're talking about retiring <laughs> I did at the young age of 27. That's, that's very sweet of you. <laughs> I, I'm, I am 39. Mm. As I said yesterday, yesterday you're like, can you come? And I'm like touching up my roots because under this is the color of a woman who's lived a life. That's right. By the years. way, we just um, we booked um, on a last yeah. minute. So I was a thank little you nervous. for nervous. Thank you yeah, for coming like, in. Thank Appreciate you. You're it. Welcome. Um, yeah, I went on what was supposed to be a healing trip, and mm. it ended up breaking my heart about a handful more times in quite deeply profound ways. And I um, have never been completely happy acting. I, yes, perhaps I, if, I, if I keep going, I'd get the opportunities to fully express my creativity, but the creativity that I have is not going to be expressed in acting. It's going to be doing my own thing. Without getting like too deep into it, what was the life-changing thing? You don't have to share if you don't. I, I would openly share. It's just it was <clears throat> so much. Mm -hmm. Like it really could be a, a, a book. Mm -hmm. I next wrote. chapter in your life <laughs> <laughs> i mean i my god i you know people talk of dark nights of the souls mm. what they don't mention is they happen more than once mm. and there's different levels mm. so i was on level 10 um after going through so much i can i could handle the pandemic i can handle the uprising my human design is built for situations like that mm. i know how to go into the community and help but it was personal issues it was just one heartbreak mm. after another you know from my immediate family to a relationship i wish i had never been in mm. um and that i broke both my ankles i had to i know that's right i, I remember now. i you had to story. put to sleep my 17 year old cat <sighs> and I, you know, as a Pisces, I know darkness well. I know depression. And this was at a whole nother level that mm. I am still trying to make sense of. Mm. Um, and I, when I, my kitty cat, I, I believe stayed alive for me mm. in her last six months to keep me here. And I made a trip to go up to Petrolia, which is in the Lost Coast. I'd been there once before, and it was so beautiful. It would be in my dreams. So me and my bestest, sweetest friend in the world, we were going to go back up. And I was like, I couldn't be gone so long. I had to administer fluids to her and give her medicine. So I can only be gone for like four days. And I was like, I just need to hug a tree. I just need to touch like ground that isn't in this energy field. Mm -hmm. And um, she passed away 
I had to put her to sleep a week before I was to leave. Mm. So I canceled my plane ticket, my rental car, and I packed my car and as though I wasn't gonna return anytime soon. I thought maybe two weeks, two months at, at max, you know? I had already broken this ankle six months prior in a forest, <laughs> trying to hug a tree. <laughs> There's definitely Did the tree fight back. What yeah, happened? no, I, I was just walking and looking at a tree and oh, um, pop, and it, it both happened in areas where I was alone with no signal. So, wow. I, you know, we went to Petrolia, and then I left my friend, and then a week into my my plan was to go river rafting mm. up the coast, go over to Orcas Island, and take some mushrooms and mm. flock around, you know. And I got one river trip in. And I was riding a bicycle on the highway uh, mm. along the coast, and I fell off the bike on an exit ramp, and I broke my ankle. Damn. So after breaking this one six months, pr like I literally was like, "Are you, are you, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> are you fucking kidding me? Mm. Like I could not go back home. I was not prepared for that." And I, you know, my plan was to go with the wind. And I was like, I'll just fucking go with the wind. And apparently <laughs> it smacked me on the side of the highway. Hurricane. Thank God I didn't get ran over. And I knew some oh friends of God. a friend. They lived in a half abandoned motel off the 101 near Willits, California, which is wow. where I was kicked out of. I was kicked out of a town. Wow. Um, <laughs> farmed for I, a little I bit. I remember this whole yeah. story now. Yeah, it is. It is it's, a story. It's an epic. It is a, it's epic. There's <laughs> it's so epic. many yeah. details in between. Every time you think that the story is over, there's it's like not. another onion peel. I know. It's, it's, I know. it's a pretty good, like a yeah. magnolia effect. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I Is it magnolia effect or is it butterfly effect? No, I'm thinking of the movie Magnolia oh. and all the different like stories in Magnolia. It just yeah, never... Yeah. I yeah. So I farmed for a little bit. There was a few weeks where I was very happy and blissful yeah. farming during fire season, no less. But I loved it. I loved yeah. the labor. It was healing for me. I was like, oh, finally, like God's giving me a cute little gift. <laughs> and then um, shit went awry because, you know, white people that own land, they think that God and the laws don't pertain to them, especially when they own a lot of property or even a little bit of property. Mm -hmm. And I, then again, I'd be like, oh, is this my fucking fight? It's not my fight. This is not my fight. I'm trying to like right keep here. away from stuff like this, you <laughs> know, but it landed on my doorstep, literally. Yeah. And I took part of it and I got kicked out of a community. Um, there are people in the community that were super grateful for my ability to confront. They said, mm. oh, we need someone just like you to hold them accountable. And I was like, yo, that's mm. not, that's not, the role I'm here to fill. What do you call those places where people like a cults? No, but besides oh. that, was, is it like a community where people work together and get free housing so they could work? And well, it is housing. a ranch. Okay, Ridgewood Ranch. It's okay. I later sued them. I lost, but that's fine because hmm. I didn't think I would win with a white judge. But uh, they own five thousand lake acres. It's called Ridgewood Ranch. It's where Sea Biscuit was laid to rest. Hmm. And it's beautiful property. So yes, you lit, you, the rent is so low. First of all, there's a housing crisis in Northern California. Mm. So the fact that the rent was so cheap and the land is so beautiful, it really keeps people mm. and their mouths shut. Mm. Um, and <coughs> the, there was a, a variety of farms there. And one of the farms was one of the most beautiful ones I've ever seen. Nothing was sold you know, even the flowers for the bees. So the food that was produced, we would then take into the kitchen and make meals and give to the community. Wow. So it would be community dinner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the concept is yeah. beautiful. There are factors in it that worked well. But in the end, there's something like Midsommar going on <laughs> somewhere there. If, uh, there's this movie, God, maybe you know this because your brain is like an encyclopedia. There's this movie with John Goodman, Demi Moore, um, they're like on a road trip and they end up going somewhere and it's like weird and gross and like who is it Humpty Humpty Hump I think he's in it no I'm gonna show you later I haven't seen that in 20 years but the feeling it left me is the feeling John I received Goodman from and this Demi Moore. I can't I can't remember anything like that I'm gonna show you later and it had to be like in the late 80s or 90s? early yeah late 80s maybe early yeah, 90s yeah, yeah. Yeah, like weird, you know, hmm. those, those <clears throat> bloodlines are passed Yeah, send it to me later. Okay, so that whole story, I mean, I, I, I do remember we had coffee and you told me this entire story for like... Three hours? Wow, it was 
yeah, it's intense. Good listener. It's intense. <laughs> yeah. It's intense. Yeah. And so your life change happens and, and um, you're like, fuck. Well, film and no, I acting? when I landed when I was in the motel and I was like, I'm going to make this terrible situation after enduring so much into positive. I'm going to farm and I'm going to stay till mid-December. And I called my agents and I said, I'm pausing everything. I might. ¿Pero qué estás haciendo, Ana? ¿Y qué estás haciendo? ¿Por qué? They were, um, I wish they said that to me <laughs> the way you just did, <laughs> um, but they didn't. Uh, they're, they're like, I. <laughs> they're like, they're like, are you sure? And then they would like keep sending me stuff, and I was like, oh no, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm really solid on this decision, because intentionally, what I wanted to do was reprogram my nervous system mm. after running around in, in this city for 20 years, mm. because you know, especially during the pandemic, that um, the ego to like produce, perform. Mm. I'm still here. I'm still relevant. Mm. It flares up so much mm -hmm. and it makes me feel guilty and it makes me feel shame and it sends me down this scope and our nervous, my nervous system is wired for production, mm. you know, and I wanted to completely relinquish that and really step away to recalibrate and re-identify who I am and what makes me happy. Because mm. if I'm on the internet and I see like dear friends booking and they're on set and they're working, the ego will flare up and I'll be like, oh my God, what did you do? What did you do? You stopped everything. How are you gonna get back in? How are you gonna pay your bills? You, you know, just immediate fear. Mm. And it literally feels like an energetic weight on my shoulders mm. and that's shame mm. and it's guilt and it's worthlessness. And mm. it's like a whole bag of other things. And then if I'm like, wait, that's my ego. Even if I choose to do that, it is not something intuitively that I know will make me happy. I am doing the right thing. And then I can kind of feel it, you know, fall off a little mm. bit. And then I can be like back into the <clears throat> present moment. So that was my first intention. And I wanted to dive more into a spiritual practice and really commit to that. Um, it, wake up at a certain time, pray, chant, meditate, tune my voice and write, you know, mm. really have a system down. And then when I got kicked out of the community, I was like, every time <laughs> I fucking try, <laughs> get shot in the heart. Um, so when I landed in Mexico, after I left, I moved, I went further up to Humboldt mm. and um, stayed on a homestead. It was a great experience. And then I was like, you know what? NorCal is so beautiful. I don't know about the people. And I went to Mexico and whatever that ugh, feeling I was getting from the rail, Redwood Veil, vale, because they said the Redwood Veil vale suck you in. Scary up there, man. And then when it kicks you out, it fucking kicks <clears throat> you out. Mm. And man, did it do a number on mm. me. And um, I had subletted my apartment, so I couldn't go back home. And I wasn't working, so I was, you know, living off my savings and unemployment. So what better place to go to than Mexico? <laughs> so I, you know, started in Baja. I only had like a week to make all this wow. decisions. I had to pack three, I, at this point I was already gone for three months. I had mm. to pack three months, mm. go home, put all my stuff away quickly, repack my backpack for Mexico for I don't know how long, mm. leave it for my subletter and left the next day. I was home for less than 48 hours. Mm. And I ended up in a pueblo called Tepotzlan, which I, thank God I know you know anything south of our border has been raped and pillaged but the people still operate the land they're still hand in hand with that land and you can feel mm. the difference mm. and that land is so healing and my spirit my nervous system like I'm my name means warrior mm. I, I don't that. what I didn't know that it's the name of a well my mom I heard it was the name of a princess. It was a, from the Guaranin tribe mm. near Ecuador and Paraguay. But what she did not know <laughs> was that it was the name of a warrior princess. So when the white folk came over, she fought for her people and she died in battle. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't want to die. <laughs> yeah, no. So I, <clears throat> yeah, and I lived in this pueblo and I lugged my water and food up and down mm. this road and cobblestone and it was not easy being mm. there 
for about the first month. And Did I you still have a bad leg? No, thank God. Okay. I could walk at that point, and yeah. I bought really good shoes because everything was cobblestone. Mm. And the <coughs> first place that I was staying was on top of a mountain down. Mm. You could call a road. No, rock, like, I saw those photos. It was steep. Yeah, that's Beautiful. Really so rough terrain. Yeah. R- super rough terrain. Yeah. And my rental car fell through <laughs> wow. because... It's Mexico. <laughs> and it happened over Dia de los Muertos, and I was going to go pick it up in Cuernavaca, and they're like, oh, we have your reservation, but we don't have a car. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Because um, my plan was rent a car. But you got good shoes, so. <laughs> I have great shoes. So I took the, the cambio every day hmm. for 10 pesos. And That's better, because you get to see the people. And It really worked yeah. out the best. Yeah. Um, it really did work out the best. And that's how I ended up making my first friends is because I would just get off at random places off the bus so I could like explore because mm. nev- nothing was on Google Maps mm. until you get into the Pueblo. So I didn't know what stores were by me or anything. So mm. um, yeah, and then I had to begin my uh, spiritual healing process after undergoing so much pain. I still am. Yeah. I still am. Well, it's a lifelong thing, too. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to be done with that, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think I've had... <laughs> I think there's phases. Yeah, I, I don't I'm, think it's... I know. I don't think it That's ends. what worries me. Yeah. And so, your spiritual healing... Oh, um, to answer your question yes. that you asked 15 minutes ago, I decided to pursue the music that I've always wanted to do, that I've been quietly singing in my home for 20 Mm. years to save my own life. And so maybe that's part of the spiritual healing, right? The, just like. (laughs) I wish it wasn't that difficult, but yeah. I mean like the choices, like making the choice to do, allowing yourself to do that and allowing yourself to be like, I want to sing, so I'm gonna sing. And like saying fuck the other things is part of that. Like, it is. you know, the fight against the whatever machine around us that moves everything. It's like you finally like find your center and you, your center tells you what you. It's like, girl, sing. Yeah. I've been telling you for 20 years. <laughs> you <better> sing. <laughs> and it just comes out differently, I imagine. Right. Does it um, like does it now manifest with a different. I don't know if confidence or or um, purpose. Purpose, yes. I, you know, I am a strong vocal woman, and I feel that I help other people find the power within their voice, and also to str- stand strong in their vulnerability, um, and to be proud of that vulnerability. The, you know, the you're too sensitive, you're too this, like that fucking bullshit like anytime someone says that to me I'll be like you're right I actually am very courageous for feeling my full scope of humanity (laughs) and having the verbiage to communicate how I feel when I feel I hope you feel that courage one day too you know and I the irony there's so much irony (laughs) is that how can I do that for other people if I can't do that for myself because singing my words and expressing my full creative self, which has been suppressed my whole life and it's like hurting me, mm. um, I have to do that for me first. Um, in order, I think, because if I couldn't do that and I was still sending those waves into the air at the receiving end, it wouldn't be authentic. It mm-hmm. wouldn't be pure. So it is a huge process it is very difficult i have to have a lot of support right now Mm. to guide me through this new creative process and to sit myself down at a desk because i spend so much time isolated and alone in very trying times we all have um and now i'm still in the season of having to sit alone with a microphone this Mm. one exactly and listen to my own words again and again and be like wrong wrong (laughs) you know are you working with somebody for your musicality or are you just for my song i actually am starting a songwriting workshop now because what i have are poems and melodies in my head and i Mm -hmm. need aid in having more structure Mm -hmm. i worked with two producers last year it didn't work out i am still on that journey to find my collaborative partners 
Um, but I didn't want to stop in that process. So I am sketching everything because yeah. I have the music in my head. I know percussion. I have the words. So and in terms of like my voice, one thing that was a beautiful gift to me in 2020 was I, I was able to work with the teacher I've always wanted to work with. She lives in up near Berkeley mm. and she teaches Raga music, which is Indian spiritual music. Mm. She teaches the art of healing through music. Mm. So I was able to take classes with her and the approach to music, the approach to the voice is so different from the Western mind. Mm. Western is produce production perfection. Mm. And this avenue, it was more spirit Based. Mm. And the origins of music began because mm. it is it was for healing intentions and for prayer. Mm. Healing. And it made me she, you know, it's my voice is a gift. Your voice is a gift. It was given to you. So why the fuck would you judge it? You mm. know? And our voice has a spirit within its own. Mm. Some days it's sad. Some days it's angry, some days it's happy, sometimes it's in love, sometimes Mm. it's lonely, and we can't judge that voice and we just have to let it, you know, go Mm. through its motions. Um, So, yeah. Well, you you gave us a little sample before we started recording. Yeah, I was so nervous. (coughs) I was off pitch. No, I'm glad you did um, because I hadn't heard you sing and you had been telling me that you have singing. I was like, no, I'm serious. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, it, it honestly came through like like something healing like it came through it I accepted it or I felt it like 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 that kind of a gift like it gave me like a sense of calmness it, it made me feel like made me feel good for you you know what I mean so mm-hmm. yeah there is there's definitely an energy in your voice that is that has that that power in, in it yeah it's Thank beautiful you. so yeah man congratulations and i hope that you continue this um journey because i'm all about like shifting and yeah. transformations and and reinventing ourselves a lot like i've done that a lot this podcast is a new reinvention you know and and um so far it's been a great journey and the reason why i think i love it is because of people like you who come in here and really share and help me understand like things about our journeys like we all have these just life journeys that oh um we don't we we don't know when we see each other in the street and we say hi we don't know how like deep our experiences um are and sometimes relate and sometimes um sometimes are identical <laughs> in different ways like we we uh-huh. we have all gone through something intense and uh-huh. has as as fucked up as it is, like we've all fucking been in that deep shit, but we've also had shared these good moments. But <clears throat> anyways, um, my point is that I appreciate um, you sharing and you um, giving us like the deep stuff too. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm all, I'm all about diving yeah. deep because, you know, the more you share in terms of vulnerability, the other person enables them to be more comfortable in sharing their vulnerability and what's really going on. And oftentimes you are right. We are going and feeling the same things at the same time, which then enables not to feel so lonely (laughs) and not to feel so isolated and to feel more seen and known in our, in our hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. We are at the end of this little episode, but we have, um, well, first of all, let me ask you first what your website is. People can look you up if they want, right? On com. Yes, my first and last name dot com. And as I said, in terms of like reprogramming my nervous system, I haven't produced a lot of anything in the last year and a half. And yeah. I'm fine with that. But, but it's there. People want to look you yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got all your dope ass mm-hmm. headshots. And um, you're on IMDb too. They want to mm-hmm. look at your history. And. Um, I hope I hope to see some music in the future, you know, produced and and put out there for everybody to enjoy and heal with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, if is there anything else that you would like to cover before we ask you the final question? Um, no. So, so we end every episode by asking our guests uh, 
little question that is um it's simple and we want you to answer in one sentence if you can okay but you don't have to answer in one sentence some people can't but if you can answer in one sentence and if somebody somewhere or if another being or an alien was trying to understand you and like all this that you do all the magic that you create and all the things that you share and somebody just went up to you and said Anai, how do you do it? <laughs> I rest. Beautiful. <laughs> My first statement was, I don't know. <laughs> I rest is I rest. good. I rest. rest is really I important. My Thank you very much. Really appreciate you taking the time to come spend Yay. an hour with us. And uh, we'll see you next week.